Hello, Ed. Let me unmute you. Okay. Try that again. So, hello. How are you doing? All right. Good. Uh, can, and you can hear me. I can hear you. I can hear you just fine. Well, excellent. I think it may just be you and me, and me. That's very possible. I I often wonder well, what it's like if it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was expecting, actually. And uh, so has it, ever it was. Been you? you actually threw off my plans. I was, oh, okay. Well, I can go. <laughs> no, that's it's a, it's better that you're here for sure because my plans uh, were probably based on some wobbly ontology. <laughs> You, you're not the only one. That <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I've, I've thought about these. I, part of what I wanted to say or what I would have said or what, if you had not been here, but, but which I'm going to say anyway, since you are yeah. here, uh, is that I haven't, I, felt, I feel, made a um, strong commitment to doing these calls in a predictable and um, professional manner in the sense that they're announced ahead of time. There's a promotional kind of cycle that, that occurs and there's, actually, there's more of an attempt to build an audience or to engage uh, a listenership or a viewership uh, or what have you. And so I did, I, I, there's various reasons for that. I mean, one, one is just you know, pro the main reason for that, I would say, is just the sheer density of things that need to be done, uh, yeah. and the um, uh, just prioritization that I, you know, one has to do from moment to moment and day to day to pick the most uh, efficient path, you know, forward. Uh, given you know some, a, a frankly hazy sense of the future that we're moving into and of you know one's own life and path. Uh, you know, on that horizon. So, um, so, so it occurred to me, like, what's the minimal thing that I can do? And the minimal thing I could do is turn on the camera mm -hmm. and show up. And um, if I can accomplish that, then, and I, I could do that on a consistent basis as a practice. You know, even if I don't know what I'm saying, even if I'm just literally saying whatever is coming into my head and nobody is there on the other side. Uh, and it's purely an exercise. If I nonetheless go through the exercise of it, I think that I'll learn something from it, one, and two, something will catch on or something will uh, begin to take shape that ultimately can lead to that you know, more complete or that more full manifestation of the thing itself or of the space that uh, I'm attempting to create. Uh, and Part of the question is, what is the nature of that space? What's the purpose of it? What's its ontology? <laughs> and uh, you know, all those open questions that I think we've been going into on the forum. And I think that they're all really, really good questions. And that it's actually worth, I think John, Johnny at one point said that time can be our ally. It's worth uh, not taking the time not to know exactly what you're doing uh, in order to ask the questions that you wouldn't ask if you presumed to know exactly how to do what you were proposing to do and simply implemented some kind of prepackaged plan or framework or, you know, methodology or what have you. So I think, I mean, the, the most important thing is presence. The most important thing is showing up and opening the space and then begin, you know, then, then going through or engaging in the feedback loops of, uh, provoking a conversation or asking a question or, or entering into an inquiry or reciting a poem or just saying whatever comes into your head. I mean, just something like we have to get some, uh, uh, some momentum uh, going uh, in order even to get to the point where things can become standardized or there could be some kind of um, you know, whole machinery for making conversations like this happen or for enabling people to make them happen on their own on the kind of terms uh, and in the kind of, um, uh, on the kind of frequency or what have you that, that we've been contemplating. So, 
Mm-hmm. That's my spiel, I guess. To mm-hmm. no, I think it it reminds me a lot. Um, I run. I once read that it um, for a, a writer to find his voice, he has to write a million words. Well, mm-hmm. that's a lot of words. <laughs> and yeah. Look at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I blogged for about nine years, and I made it to maybe a quarter of a million or so. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of times, when I have time, or and it's and it's like I think anything else. If you talk to people who who write professionally, I don't. But they all tell you, well, it's it's like their job. They get up and they go do it. Mm-hmm. So they sit down and they write, and it's maybe not what they want to write. And maybe it's not exactly what they thought they were going to write, but they have to, you have to write. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, I just told myself, okay, well, I'm just going to write a thousand words a day. And, and what, what I found myself doing was, was trying to clarify things that, that I, I didn't know about, or I hadn't thought through, or, you know, most things that aren't get, don't get thought through Mm -hmm. for whatever reasons. And those are opportunities to do that. And you're in the kind of the unique uh, position because we have these opportunities technologically mm-hmm. to try to create a public sphere to to do that in. So it's like you said, getting there, doing that. You know, you, you have to in that in that case uh, speak or act out those words, not just write them down on a piece of paper that you may or may not keep, or you may or may not have in a in a notebook somewhere. But you know they 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 still have to be done, and you can only you can only find out like Yogi Berra said, you can only know what you, what you have to say once you've heard what you've said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You can only yeah. really say, and this is you know part of part of what it had occurred to me in my sort of preparations or my uh, mm-hmm. my walk about the neighborhood, you know, uh, ahead of this call was you can only really say what comes into your head too yeah. like uh even no, no matter how well thought out it is ultimately it has to come into you in some way yes. it has to occur to you in some way and then from there you could bring it forth and you know you could bring it forth a greater or lesser skill uh but engaging in that process where you have where you discover what it is that you have to say uh and what is even occurring to you to say which is a mysterious kind of thing actually because it well, really it's, it's <laughs> fascinating <Yeah>, it's a... <laughs> when you start getting into that uh, split personality thing where you because where you, every once in a while when you're in that flow you, you kind of feel yourself sneaking out and going who is that over there <laughs> well yeah and and that's that's what's so interesting about the writing process is because is that you open yourself up to voices and um and some of those voices sound like you in the sense, in the way that you know yourself to be or how you're familiar to yourself. And others don't sound like you and they could be coming from some other layer. Who knows? I mean, that's really the, where the ontological kind of wobbliness comes in is really where, where, where is thought coming from? Where are voices coming from? Ultimately, we're asking about the nature of consciousness. And then really, you know, from there in that sort of field of possibilities, it kind of throws... Uh, things wide open and I, actually like makes it harder it, it makes it in a sense hard it complicates action in one sense on the other hand you've taken action and you've engaged in inquiry so it's a form of action inquiry uh, bill torbert's uh phrase that uh generates uh information or generates well what what we might call information at one level uh but mm. then really feeds back into that whole ecosystem of voices uh, that begin kind of awakening and speaking uh, to you, and uh, even as you're speaking them. So it gets very postmodern and starts to sound French and deconstructionist and, you know, context well, upon context. See, that's, that's the thing. I, you, a lot of folks on the platform here, and John, John does that a lot too. Nate Date was very good at that. They would talk about these postmodern things. And, and I, I missed most of postmodernism, fortunately. Um, for whatever reasons and where I was and what I was doing, um, it didn't concern me that much because every time I, I started heading down that path, I, I had a lot of people that had to, to fight with it professionally because they, they, they couldn't accept what, what was going on there. And so that would come up every once in a while and go, okay, well, that's just, it's all nonsense to me. And, and since it's nonsense, I won't devote any attention to it. And, and so I was able to miss that. But I think it's important that we know 
or that we have an idea, even if it's wobbly, what our ontologies are. I, I think it's absolutely essential to, and this goes back to the posting I once made about that search for self idea that was you know, like, like started me off back when I was in college. Um, you, you can't ever know who you are unless you know what you believe or what you think you believe. Mm -hmm. And once you, once you do that, periodically, I sit down. One of the things I do write in my journal every once in a while is on my what does I believe page. And if I could find mm -hmm. them all going back through there, it would be very interesting, I'm sure, to me to see what's been on the page from time to time. Mm -hmm. Because we have to kind of set a foundation that we can that we can stand on to deal with all of these things and these complexities and the and the and the various arrangements of intensities that we always have to deal with when we're trying to to come to terms with with whatever it is that we're thinking or where we think that comes from. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a it's a it, it's not cut and dry, and there's there's different views on it. But I think it's important that we that we know well, well what do I what do I think it is, mm -hmm. and I th I think every every one of those is a working hypothesis that's worth exploring. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not like Newton who never had a hypothesis; she's just new stuff. You know, I only have hypotheses, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I can but only do that if I have some some point that I can. For me, that's how I operate. Compare it to in some way and say, okay. Well, does does that help me further along this path that I think I'm going down, mm -hmm. or is this? And even if I pursue it, it might turn out. Oh, well, this is a sidetrack. You know, I haven't really lost sight. I can always kind of get back to where I think I was heading. But that's 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 how we never move forward in a straight line. Mm -hmm. So, what that's, do you what do you believe about belief? What is your belief in belief? My belief in belief. I believe that at some point we come up against. Ideas, notions, feelings, or whatnot that that seem almost impossible to get behind. the uh, The Germans have a wonderful word. It's called hinterfragen, and hinter means behind, and fragen means question. And so it's that questioning behind things. You you need to to try and to dig in and say, well, well, what what's on the other side, or what is the bedrock that that's on. And there's, there's some things that we encounter in life, and I think the digger you deep, the more you find, um, there is no deeper at some point. Now, I have had experiences where it's gone deeper, but that bedrock that you think you're looking for kind of goes away, mm -hmm. which I've never found to be a terribly uncomfortable feeling. Some people do. Um, I read once that uh, one of the highest rates of suicides among professional groups are, are um, subatomic physicists mm -hmm. because they're very materialistic when they start and they're into science and causality and things that work together and, and there's laws for everything. And, 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 and at some point you kind of like punch through and you, and you come out on another side that doesn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. So the things that you believed you, you, you have trouble believing anymore. And that, that, can, that can lead to a, a crisis of, of consciousness, self, whatever you want. And if you, if you don't come to terms with that in some way, well, then one of the ways, okay, well, I, I'm just not going to deal with it anymore. That's, mm -hmm. to, to, that's what, what, what suicide is. I don't want to deal with it anymore. I happen to have a belief system that says that's not going to get you off the hook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, but that's where I come, where I come from, because of how how I've assembled what I I consider my own, you know, how the world works, kinds of thing. Mm -hmm. Would or you describe that as a as a metaphysics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. I'm I'm a big fan of metaphysics. I, I don't think everything can be described in in physical terms. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think the whole idea that we can even talk about physical things is metaphysical. In a sense, I mean that this whole this whole consciousness thing to me is, you know, like where does that come from? That's why I get all bent out of shape when people like Denon, you know, start going off about oh, well, it's just it, and it, to them it is just an epiphenomenon. Well, that doesn't really tell me anything, and and I I was affiliated with a group for a long time that that I kind of agree with the one of the principles that they always talked about was. Um, Coincidence, for example, is, is simply a label you don't you put on something you can't explain. 
That, that's all it is. Well, that's nice, except I ran into them all the time. Some of them are really fascinating. And then I like to, I like to, I, I like to think about it. One of the coincidences in my life, um, as a matter of fact, it's one of my youngest daughter's favorite one, um, on why I don't play the lottery. And because the whole idea is to get six out of 49 and then, you know, you get the right numbers. And then everybody likes to throw, even though the odds that are like one in 13 million, there are people that get six out of 49 right. But if mm -hmm. you want to win the big jackpot, you have to have the special bonus number, which is the number on your ticket or something in addition to that. And so every once in a while when I had, had those lucky feelings, I go, okay, well, I'll go in and I'll, I'll uh, you know, I have a set of numbers that I would play. I'd go in and I'd play it. And then, but I always ask myself, well, why do you do that? Because, you know, you, nothing's going to come of it. And, uh, um, you know, our family motto, the Mahoods, is if, if it weren't for bad luck, we'd have no luck at all. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I played it one, one time, and, and, and believe it or not, I was one number off every number, including the special number. Just hmm. one. <laughs> If it was, if it was the adjacent four, number, you mean? So if it was six, you had seven, that kind of a thing? Seven or, 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 or five. Uh -huh. It was one yeah. off on every one, just one and only one on every number, including the, including the, the last number. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that, that's a, to me, that, that's a very fascinating coincidence. But for me, I, I took it more in the Jungian sense of synchronicity. And, and that's why I like to say, so, so the big fella said, when are you going to get it? You're not going to get it. <laughs> so it's like, well, okay. And, and I've never, ever since that time, ever felt the slightest urge <laughs> to ever want to play a lottery. Hmm. So I say, but I, and I showed that to people and they're just going, oh, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's all one off. So mm -hmm. my, my youngest daughter carries that slip around in her wallet say, for people <laughs> Okay, so if we're talking about a metaphysics and belief systems, then that would be an experience. Uh, it would um, uh, be just some kind of raw uh, data, right? That you would interpret in some way according to exactly. according your... To, to, my, to my system of belief and being. And the, it, it might also spur a, a hypothesis, right? If you having that kind of put. synchronicity experience might lead you to posit something about the yes. nature of mind or something about the nature yes. of phenomena. Uh, and how, how, how would you then? I mean, th in this case in particular, like how, how, how do you actually, you say you, you write down lists and mm -hmm. you literally write down what you believe. I, I believe X, Y, or Z. So you right. construct these... Um, we can say user stories uh, about, um, and just mixing contexts here, but user stories about reality, if you will. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious about the real actual shape and form of that and what that looks like in your, in your world, in your, right? I mean, how, how, how do you actually interact with those beliefs uh, so that like when an experience of the, such as the one you described comes up, you might respond to it in a certain way or regard yes. it in a certain way. Yes. And, and the one that I, that I drew from that, because I believe that there, we may not be able to explain why things happen. That's the coincidence part. But that doesn't matter, mean for me that that event is not meaningful in some way. That's the synchronicity thing. Mm -hmm. that Jung talks, talks about. And I, I found that a useful notion. That was one of the things I kind of brought in and said, okay, there's such a, and for me, one of, one of my assumptions about life is there are meaningful coincidences. Mm -hmm. So not every coincidence I run into is meaningless. It, it may be, it, it may lead nowhere, but in other cases, it, it might have meaning. So, so that's something I like, like most beliefs, I think we just carry around in the back of our mind or our back pockets or the, the list in our journal or wherever that may be. Um, I, I tend to try to keep mind to as few as possible and as simple as possible. That's, that's the other thing. So a long time ago, I started, um, I always want to know about something. Well, how does it, how does it work at root? You know, how can I get to the very basis of it? That's why I'm always asking about, well, what do we think Slaughter Dyke's assuming here? Or, or what do we think Gapeser was presupposing when he made this, this statement? That, that whole presupposition, 
the things that end up, we all are on ontologies in the end are sort of wobbly, but for some people, they're less wobbly than for others. Mm -hmm. And it's always difficult to deal with another person's ontology because you have to decide, do I believe those things or don't I? Because we are talking about very fundamental things. Mm -hmm. and to me, that's what, that, that's what Collingwood describes as, as metaphysics. But he, for him, metaphysics is the process of uncovering those most fundamental assumptions. Mm -hmm. So I find just digging down there to find out, I, I, I don't think I can get behind this one for now. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I can't get behind it later. So for one, for me, one of the very basic fundamental ass assumptions that I operate on through life is that consciousness is primary. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's as, that's the entire extent of the of the assumption. Consciousness is primary. So um, if I were to take a nasty tone, I would say matter is an epiphenomenon of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think. I think it's a natural result of it, basically. But you see, there again, I think that. Mm -hmm. I can't say I don't know that. I can't prove it. Um, but the mere fact that I think that consciousness is, is a bigger deal than most people would, would like to as, as assume or admit, that is, for me, one of those fundamental things. So I spend a lot of my time reading people I don't like looking for reasons not to believe that mm -hmm. because that's another one of my fundamental beliefs is everything must be challengeable. You know, there are no sacred cows. Mm -hmm. can't, can't have that. You know, mm -hmm. and I can believe something strongly and somebody can confront me with something else. And maybe it does upset me to a certain extent and I can get all riled up about stuff. You know, I've got a bruised version of a slaughter dyke text to prove it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and most of the time I do that is because, he, he won't come clean for me, you know. It's like, well, right there, you needed to say it, buddy, and you did <laughs> you know, and I don't have him in front of me to go, okay, fess up. What is it you're really thinking now? <laughs> and 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 that's where that's where my frustration comes in with him, for example, because mm -hmm. I can't I can't get him to to nail that down. Other writers um are, are re really clear in what that is and how that functions. I've I've been reading a lot ever since our discussion with um Greg Thomas on uh, Albert Murray. I've been reading Albert Murray a lot. Mm -hmm. And and he's very clear. Mm -hmm. Right up front, tells you really right out, no hesitation. This is this is where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. And it's you true. can you can agree or not agree, you can just but once you know that, everything he says makes every makes sense in light of that. Mm -hmm. And then you can go, okay, well, if I, if he changed this or if I changed that, where would it lead? And, and so I can speculate my way also through his texts to see, okay, well, well, how does a change of assumption, where would that lead us to? We do that when we read literature, you know, a character does something, we go, oh, well, he, you know, that's going to get him in the who's gal, or he's going to end up dead if he keeps that up. Mm -hmm. And then he manages to escape death at some point because he did change a little something about what he what he thought. We go, okay, well that's that's fine. So you know, things like foreshadowing and 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 after the factness those those come out of how we build these hypotheses about how we think things will unfold because you know the future is undetermined. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it, it might be to the author when he's writing. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But but when I encounter that, I need to think. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting because um, it I, I I think that it has a recursive quality to it as well, and that <laughs> what, what the insofar as you're engaging in a critical discourse upon phenomena upon the phenomena that you experience, and that through that that critical process, you're constructing uh, some sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. So now, I feel like channeling Johnny, Johnny Davis for a moment now and, and asking, mm -hmm. what is, does that sense of what meaning is have a shape? <laughs> does that, where is that sense of meaning? Like to, to there's something uh, I think tactile about, about it in, in the sense of feeling. We have a feeling for our beliefs. There's something about, mm -hmm. it's that, about the belief that carries a feeling quality or an intensity, as Gabe, Gabe Sir yeah. would say, yeah. Um, yeah. It con constitutive uh, to it, uh, and um, in a, in a way that 
gives form, shape, energy, what have you, to the cognitive content, right? To whatever symbols mm-hmm. you use, language you use to describe it. So you said, for example, you said consciousness is primary. That's a fundamental bedrock belief. And when you say consciousness is primary, I register the a feeling um, com- aspect, a dimension to that. Okay. Uh, just as I would in reading Albert Murray, there's mm-hmm. a, f- a feeling, a strength of feeling uh, that, yeah. yes. that he transmits or that is um, that one experiences as a reader of his texts that mm-hmm. I think um, to compare it uh, aesthetically even, just to compare it aesthetically to Sloterdijk's text doesn't ca- doesn't, you know, is quite distinct. Uh, mm-hmm. In Sloterdijk, I, I think there is not the same quality of, of feeling or of intensity of feeling. There's mm-hmm. a kind of intellectual aloofness. Uh, there's a kind of ha- hiding out, sort of being on either side of you, a kind of hall of mirrors type of, um, yeah, uh, I don't yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. So he, I, I think that there's a different quality to to yeah. to these two writers, and that it has something to do, perhaps even with how each might understand the nature of consciousness, the, mm-hmm. and even the nature of belief, uh, because my sense about Sloterdijk is that he doesn't believe in belief in the same way that you yeah. you might uh that i yeah, yeah i think that's a tr- an accurate statement and, and uh, i think that that is a symptom of or a characteristic of the postmodern um kind of french philosophical french german you know late 20th century kind of philo- mm-hmm. philosophical mindset it's it's yeah. that radical um doubt or that radical suspicion or that the, the um even a politics of suspicion is, is, is part of like the, the background experience there where everything kind of consumes itself. Belief or, or rather critique or doubt or questioning or inquiry kind of consumes its own subject. <laughs> it consumes the self. It consumes the consciousness even, I think you could say that uh, to, um, to one who hasn't gone through the ringer of that particular, um, you know, from that thought spiraling in upon itself, which is kind of mm-hmm. postmodern, post-structuralist deconstructionism that kind of, you know, destroys like all, you know, solidity, destroys all mm-hmm. sense of, of framework. Um, that I, the, I'm just feeling my way through this here, but I think that part of what happens in that, um, in the history of that thought is that it exhausts itself, right? You just mm-hmm. get tired. You, there's nothing left to, to destroy. Yes. There's nothing left to deconstruct, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's nothing left. Not even consciousness is left, uh, mm-hmm. in, a, in a, right? Because you are um, sort of, pro- you're processing consciousness, or at least your beliefs about consciousness, uh, through the deconstructive kind of, you know, meat grinder, and you end up with really nothing. I mean, that is n- that's pure nihilism, right? And yes, I, I think that Sloterdijk is writing f- from and out of pure nihilism. I, th- I think he's like, he's entered into the, the heart of the vortex that Nietzsche described as the, the coming you know, history of, of European culture. And I think he's trying to get to, to come out of that, to offer, to, to provide, I don't know, f- <laughs> to move out of it in some way, like to, to mm-hmm. create a space where something healthier could emerge, something more... Mm-hmm humane perhaps uh, it's hard to really come up with the best adjectives for it yeah yeah but um there's a kind of there i think that there is that experience of of just pure nihilism uh in the heart of sloterdijk's work and in the discourse or the tradition that he's coming out of the continental you know european the continental philosophy tradition and i see him as kind of working through it at, at, at some level but but the wobbliness and the, the 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 sense that he can't really just come out and say it like you want him to, right? Mm-hmm. I think yeah, is I part. <laughs> it's part of um, part of uh, well, it's part of that, and that may not be a very good description of it. It may not be a very sophisticated way of understanding it, but um, but so, somehow I feel like we're in the we're still in the grips of this experience of 
of nothingness. Uh, well, I think anybody, uh, anybody that that I, I, I'm, I'm looking for the word in English now. In in German, you can say to let yourself into something. Lass dich drauf ein. And 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 there's there's always a danger. I think if I let myself get into that deconstructionism i can also be sucked into it mm. you know it's 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 there's one thing to put your your toe in the water to see if it's cold and there's another thing to jump in to see if you can swim around but you might get washed out to sea as well mm -hmm. and 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 those are everyday experiences that we can have and and maybe we did have to slight or to, to varying degrees. Maybe at one time we did get kind of drawn out by the ocean current to the point where we were almost panicking, but m managed to get back to shore. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very deep existential experience that one has. And it's not just applicable to swimming in the ocean. Mm -hmm. it, it's just as applicable in my little world of how I put it together to engaging um, a text. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I did learn um, from my magician friends was that's a very real possibility. Mm -hmm. It's a more real possibility than you even want to admit in your own little <laughs> metaphorical analogy drawing that you're doing right now. You, you, you can go literally, you can go to hell <laughs> mm -hmm. and it can be that quick. And then mm -hmm. you're gone. You have to be aware of that. And you have to say, am I willing to risk this? You have to, and this is, this was that whole talk about courage that we had recently. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you, you do have to decide. And to me, it's not the coward who says, I don't want to do that. The coward is the one who says, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid. There's another person that says, I don't want to do that because that risk is too large for what I think that I'm about here in life. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to jeopardize this. Mm -hmm. Maybe later, maybe when I feel different. You know, any any great strategist from Lao Tzu to Clausewitz will tell you, you don't engage the enemy when you're feeling weak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's not really the time to be getting uppity about, well, okay, we're going to go get them now. You know, maybe you want to sit back and reflect and, you know, consolidate, reinforce oneself. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between what I would call the conscious and the unconscious decision not to do something. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that, that really life changing or life central life central decisions have to be made or should be made consciously. Let's put it that way. They don't have to be. We make them all the time when we're not conscious of them. Mm -hmm. But but they should be as conscious as we can we can absolutely get them. I I believe. See, that's another one of my beliefs. Mm -hmm. We should be as conscious as possible, as often as possible, for as much of our waking time as possible. Mm -hmm. We should acknowledge that we're not always conscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what do you think about this this question of nihilism? Because I feel like it's at the heart of things. I mean, the this, the anecdote you shared about the physicist, whose yeah. you know system of yeah. beliefs uh, has you know been just you know dis disintegrated you know through the process of going deeper and deeper and deeper until you get to the point where there's nothing deeper. There's nothing yeah. there, yeah. Uh, and that person decides that they no longer want to live. They can no longer live in a world they that no doesn't include their belief system, uh, or. Uh, I mean, isn't what? What do you make of, of 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 Nietzsche's cultural diagnosis, which you know is very pretty well, uh, I think, uh, discussed you know by this point and pretty well like understood uh, as far as the um, you know the sort of dead end uh, of uh, of Western metaphysics and of um, of the belief systems from traditional you know, Christianity to Scientism uh, that have predominated, you know, it, mm -hmm. to, to this point, where, what do, what do you make of like the status of that? Like in terms of how it shapes our world and how, um, how, how would you propose to engage that if it's a real thing? Like if that, if that there's a, there's a, there's a whole lot of people, uh, and an entire society, even a civilization that's kind of in the, in the vortex of that mm -hmm. place where you don't want to go because yeah. there, is a, there is a dragon of nothingness there. there you know, th that, that way la madness lies, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, you, you, and you see that, 
you say oh, no and you, you you may have even virtually you know even experienced it in, in yourself right so that you can I've, I've 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 been there i've done that we don't need to go there we've seen where that road leads but nonetheless it seems that a whole lot of people are still you know caught up in those currents yeah uh and the world itself our life world right well, take a plane. I'm going to be taking a plane. If you're going to drive uh, on the on the streets, if you're going to take a subway, anything, it's subject to events that are generated out of that uh, dynamic. How do we really relate to that, right? How do we really position ourselves, uh, tell the stories that we do, or believe the things that we believe in a world that is gripped by um, this? this kind of like nothingness, this dragon of nothingness uh, mm. at its core. Uh, and, that, and, where, and where that is actually, it, it's enhanced and empowered by our technological capabilities so that it's actually accelerating and it's becoming more intense uh, the, the further it, we go. It, it can be, yeah, yeah, it can be. I, I hate, I'm one of those people, I really hate this, the, to talk in terms of like positive and negative or, or that, that's why I like to avoid spatial metaphor. I don't like up and down, but you know, even in and out is, is sometime, but the in intensity, that's one of the things that Gates just said that resonated with me, that, that it's a matter of intensity. And, and I, and I, and nihilism, this, this, I'm going to call it this feeling of nothingness is a feeling. I'm, I'm not absolutely convinced at this point in my life that there is nothing as nihilism imagines nothing to be. You know, in, in um, I, I spent a lot of time with um, uh, Kabbalah. And in Kabbalah, there's a, a notion called the Ein Sof. And the Ein Sof is basically the no thing. And a no thing is different than nothing. They're spelled the same. I can but I have to pronounce them differently in order to, to bring those off. And it is from this no thing, that means it's not something that we would formulate in concrete three-dimensional or maybe four-dimensional time, space, coordinational. We can't, we, we, that's the part that starts getting a, tricky for us. Mm -hmm. We have enough trouble trying to, to, to deal with a four-dimensional space-time continuum. Most mm -hmm. people don't get that at all. I, I think most people have trouble to come near with their a three dimensional space. Mm -hmm. You know, at least when I see them driving down a highway, I do. Mm -hmm. So, so this no thing may not be nothing in the nihilistic sense. And if you if you I have a, a friend, he's a philosophy professor in in uh, Tulane, an adjunct, and he teaches meditation. He's probably the the, the best meditator I've ever met. Hmm. And and he's often spoke to me of of um, experiences of nothingness, but it's no thingness mm -hmm. when he's that he's talking about, not nothingness. It's not. It's anything but nihilistic. Mm -hmm. You know, when 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 he sits there and, and is trying to relate this in 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 his own in his own way, and it's generally because it relates to some question I asked. There's there's a sense of peace and beingness that that is there that is certainly well to me welcoming, mm -hmm. not pushing away, you know, mm -hmm. or, or shoving away. Whereas when I do hear about and I do see this in deconstructionism, you can break it down so that there's absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. But when and with the physicists to go back to the example, when you pop through. It can be nothing or it can be no thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that depends, and it just so happens that the professor and I share this idea that consciousness is, is primary. We, we both share that belief. Mm -hmm. We think that it all starts with consciousness and that you can't put your fingers on it. You can't see it, but somehow it's there. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Okay. And it is out of that that, that, that things may arise. I, I just finished uh, today reading uh, Fred Allen Wolf's uh, Space Warps and Time Loops. Mm -hmm. every, every once in a while, I I like to get my head just slapped around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a roller coaster ride. <laughs> yeah, and but I, we got to in in the last chapter that we got to. 
he he brought that that same idea up as as well. It's he was describing how particles and antiparticles come up and do they go forward or backward in time or whatnot. And then it 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 I know I'd read it at least a hundred times in the the previous two hundred pages. This all happens in a vacuum. This <laughs> oh, this all comes out of nowhere, out of nothing. You know, the the, the definition of vacuum is nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's where it all comes from. So that's a no th to me. That's not nothing. That's certainly not nihilistic. Mm -hmm. It's creative. It's produce. It's you know, and it, we and. Okay, it took four billion uh, years of evolution to get us here. I don't care, you know. But we're here. We can deal with this, you know. That mm -hmm. that part doesn't matter. But you know, all of a sudden, here we are, and we can, and we have to. Mm -hmm. and we we cannot not deal with these kinds of things. We can avoid them and run away with them. But basically, if we want to figure out who we are, we, we have to start thinking about these things because they are involved in our beliefs. And so I'm sitting there, and I was going, well, well, gee, that's pretty interesting, Fred. This all comes on and off, and, you know, how do you manage that? And two pages later, he's talking, and I, I, I knew he had done this, but it was nice that he, he brought this before. He spent a lot of time studying with one of uh, modern day's most, um, I, I consider, profound um, uh, letter Kabbalists, Carlos Suarez, mm -hmm. because Suarez was explaining to him how the Hebrew letters explain all the stuff that uh, Feynman was coming up with with his... his time space uh, diagrams and said, well, it actually has to work that way, I think, mm -hmm. you know, but again, he's the, I think it has to work that way. So this all comes out of nothing. So the nothing that we get to is there's like a positive nothing and a negative nothing. If I mm -hmm. can put it in really banal words that I absolutely think don't, don't even approach <laughs> driving what I'm saying. <laughs> well, it's a hypothesis. So, <laughs> yeah, and, well, and that's the so the working hypothesis at the moment. Okay, let's we'll work with positive and negative nothings in the moment for the moment. You know? Or, or when we read in Genesis that that uh, the world was out without form and void. You know, in in Hebrew, it's uh, tofu vabohu. You know? Well, it's not tofu in that sense, <laughs> <laughs> even though Johnny thinks it tastes like tofu. <laughs> Or at least everything in the dream realm tastes like tofu. <laughs> yeah, it tastes like tofu. <laughs> well, uh, I found it. a very interesting um, observation. Uh, but but this but in this this there's a boiling cauldron of nothingness. But that was all chaos. And I was like, okay, so that's that's an image that we have throughout our entire mythology. Every mythology's got a lot of chaos in it, and so we end up with this order out of chaos thing. Mm -hmm. And and so. The chaos is a is a something because we gave it a name. Mm -hmm. and when we say nothing, we're trying to say, well, it doesn't even have a name. And right. Although names have a big role in everything, but you label it, you're kind of stuck with it. <laughs> you know, and that's why this is, we I think at, at right at this point, we actually come to a limit of our language. You know, where because I can't say, well, what is a positive nothingness as opposed to a negative nothingness? Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking to people who understand the vocabulary that I'm using when I'm talking about positive nothing, I can say ain't so. And then people, oh, okay, and they can move on you know, mm -hmm. because we don't we don't have to sit there and discuss, well, what is that? Right. You have a signifier and you have a, a signified. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And it, it, it relates to something. And I know whatever it relates to to me is not what it relates to to them, but it's close. It's the like the, the point where, you know, we kind of touch, mm -hmm. you know, we're tangential to each other at that moment. And, so we share something and it's fine. Mm -hmm. it, 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 enough for the moment. And we can all go off and explore it and come back and ex exchange whatever it is, ideas that we might have about it or experiences that we've had where we think we've come closer to that. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I want to go back to Sloterdijk because the other thing I'm reminded of is that he's, he's responding in a lot of ways to Heidegger. And Heidegger mm -hmm. wrote an interesting essay called What is Metaphysics? Where... He uh, is uh, attempting to kind of get at the deeper question, like to get at the deeper essence of what we're even talking about here when we're talking about uh, metaphysics or the end of metaphysics or uh, the destruction or the deconstruction of metaphysics or the death of God or what have you. Uh, and what he comes to is that uh, we experience the essence of metaphysics in this mood of anxiety. Right? anxiety, angst, uh, 
and that the nothing is revealed uh, by that particular experience. Uh, so that frames it in a certain way, right? I mean, that you could say is the negative nothing that he's yeah. dealing with. And he's locating or ascribing this, um, this no, no thingness uh, mm -hmm. to, to the sort of demotive or the impulse, he wouldn't use these words, but no. really what metaphysics is about. It's some construction around, ar around that nothing. It's not a simple presence. It's not a thing at hand. Uh, it, it, it's not a tool. Uh, it's not a simple pheno you know, object or phenomenon, but, he, but that's as far as it goes. Right? And not until his later writings does he kind of spin out this, this alternative metaphysics with uh, earth and, and heaven and gods and uh, you know, various elemental sort of mythopoetical forces that, that he posits. But it's coming out of that, that encounter that I think he was articulating. And, and, and you know, he, didn't, he, he wouldn't talk about consciousness. He didn't use a, that mm -hmm. word. Uh, he he yeah. tried to avoid using that word mm -hmm. because he saw it as a reification, I think. He saw it as ascribing thingness or some kind of objective being uh, to something which does not have objective being, which is not um, a being in the ontic, what he's called the ontic sense, but a but ontological being or the being of being. Anyway, I mean, it gets yeah. uh, kind of convoluted uh, or it could get convoluted if, if, you, if you let it. Um, but Well, that's one of those points where it's really hard to get beyond. Indeed. And also, it, it's hard to get beyond if you don't have a sort of language for it. And so that's part of, I think, what, what Heidegger's project involved was coming to, you used a German word earlier that you said didn't translate well, but letting yourself into or... Well, say, yeah, you can let yourself into something. Lass dich drauf ein. Um, which means you try to get into to see what it's like from the inside. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, in spatial terms, a lot, a lot of the, the, the words that we use to describe these things um, have uh, spatial connotations to them. Mm -hmm. So I, I see that, that there's a sense of that in Heidegger as well. He, he describes thinking as walking. He has a, a couple of essays mm -hmm. where uh, the, the premise of the, of the essay is that, uh, different characters are walking along a country path or, or one is walking through a forest, the black forest, and one comes across a clearing. It's very spatial in, in, that, in that sense. And, and then he, he saw himself as on the way to, to language, right? So there, there's this whole, I think, maybe expansion into a negative nothing and trying to find the positive nothing through it, but not having the language, not being able to draw on a theological metaphysics or an onto a theological me uh, metaphysics to describe it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there isn't as, as much of there isn't really cross cultural type of dialogue in, in Heidegger toward the end of his life I, I know that he corresponded with um, uh, was it Shunryu Suzuki one of the mm -hmm. one of the uh, early uh, sort of uh, yeah, translators uh, of yeah. Zen in, into the West yeah but, but Slaughterdike seems to be coming out of that, and there isn't just there, there just isn't in a tradition that that's cons consumed itself through deconstruction and, and postmodernism, and that also has you know come at least in the philosophical right realms uh, to the um, rejection you know of its cultural inheritance, uh, in, you know, seeing implicating it or, or, or ascribing it as one of the causes for events of the 20th century, right? The, 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 there's all of these motifs of um, demise, of collapse, uh, and of um, destruction in, in our, you know, in, in, Western civilization, in Western culture and Western philosophy. And, um, and so, I mean, I guess part of, part of what we're talking about when we're talking about nothing is the spectrum from the negative nothing that is at the heart of the collapse of Western civilization uh, and the positive nothing that uh, was really there all along, right? And some, mm -hmm. right? And some, mm -hmm. I think we have to say, uh, I would be, I'd post that as a hypothesis. I might believe that. 
that could be understood, signified, discussed, that could have a different kind of language and different kind of culture mm -hmm. uh, that may be coming partly out of Western, but really is, I think, coming also from um, Indian culture, Asian culture, uh, Buddhism, uh, all the religions, right? There, there's now like the, the integral attempt to recover the esoteric essences and the, mm -hmm. the positive um, contributions you know, of, the, of the great traditions. And to, I guess, you know, part of the project is to construct a, a new metaphysics, but it's kind of muddied because there's so much lack of critical thought that often goes into uh, those discourses, right? Mm -hmm. So what we gain f through that post postmodern move and through that kind of hypercritical stance is the ability to see through bullshit on the one mm -hmm. hand, but if that's not supplemented by some sense, a richer sense of spaciousness or of generativity that we can... Um, you know, experience in that nothing, that friendly nothingness, that good nothingness, mm -hmm. uh, that, um, well, if we can supplement it with that, or if really that could be the, the home uh, and, and the critique could arise and have a place, because I, I think we need to see through bullshit, right? We need to cut through yes. the crap. And um, to me, that is alluring. That, you know, that promises somewhere yes. to go. That promises something to, to build or some basis to create upon. I have trouble talking about it a lot. And well, uh, we, we all we all do. I, I can understand that you do. You know, one of the one of the most encouraging things that I've read, because I think I know you're, you're we need to think about things that matter and we need to be able to talk about them. But we also have to be able to make others aware that that they do matter in some way, mm -hmm. however it is that we conceive that mattering being. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the most encouraging voices that I've, that I've, I've encountered lately was, um, was the article that Nate gave us by uh, Latour, mm -hmm. where he said, we went too far. Mm -hmm. we, we, we got so wrapped up in what we were doing. We got carried away with ourselves. We were so pleased with ourselves that we really screwed things up. And 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 his suggestion, and we we now need to just fess up. Okay, that was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. the, the The process may be correct. Peterson says the same same thing. The the post human or the deconstructions they're absolutely correct. There are an infinite number of interpretations for any given text. That's true. Mm -hmm. But there aren't an infinite number of ter interpretations of a text that matter. And it's only the ones that matter. Now, we have to figure mm -hmm. out how that, how that, where that matter yeah. And we don't have the time for the infinite interpretations of the text either. That's, what, that's one of the key features. That's one of the key tip-offs that you might be on the wrong path. You see, because you can't explore them all. Th mm -hmm. That's the wrong. You can't. Even if you wanted to, even if everybody decided to take an almost infinite number themselves, we can't do it. So maybe we need to look for a more efficient way. This is another thing I got out of uh, Wolf's book, which I didn't understand half the words in. But it's the fact that in this probabilistic space of subatomic whatever, you, you always look at what all possible probabilities could be. But in the end, they all come back to one. They mm -hmm. have to add up to one. And so what you do is you kind of look at, well, where's the little ano anomaly that's not letting me get to one? Mm -hmm. That means you actually focus on something. You actually get something that pops out and say, okay, well, I can look at this a little more closely in order to deal with that. That, that is something that would then matter in that, in that situation. So we need to look for these things that matter. So how we agree on what matters and, and that's a real challenge, I believe. I think you're really onto something here because we have been so influenced by so much of, you know, since God's been dead or God died, but the only God that died is the ones that fundamentalist Christians in America are trying to keep alive, you know. Now, he ain't going to do it. It's not going to, that's exactly who he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So so reinforcing that one isn't, isn't getting anybody anywhere. We're, we're not making, you know, any kind of, 
Um, I hate the word progress. Too. <laughs> <laughs> headway. Uh, headway. That's yeah. Right, yeah. Headway. Yeah. We're looking somewhere we're moving. Okay. We yeah. haven't made any headway in a, in a lot of areas and we, we seem to be losing ground in a lot simply because it's all spreading out and people, people are going, Oh, well, why should I even care? Because in the end, and this is the, the problem with it all, figuring out what you believe is damn hard work. It takes a lot of effort and energy to figure out what you believe. What are you willing to stand up for? And one of the things, Bonhoeffer, I think it was, it said, what are you willing to die for? Mm -hmm. you know, can you say what that is? I'm not asking you that's a rhetorical question in this mm -hmm. case, but, yeah. but it's a question we all need to be asking ourselves. Mm -hmm. Where would I be willing to lay down my life? And if that's, why? Why is that, you know, I have something to look at. And I think it's a positive thing because I don't want to lay down my life. I'd like to stay alive for a few more years. Mm -hmm. and to do that, I need to know, well, how do I avoid the situation where that would come about? And, well, what brings that? What are the factors that are playing into that? How do other people illuminate things for me by, by things that they say? that Because that I, I interpret them all in terms of my own belief system. That's my, you know, I was, uh, my, my German studies turned me into a, a really fundamental kind of hermeneutica, you know, there's, there's constraints and there's, there's factors and you look at them and you play with them and there's an interaction and it's always moving this recur this idea of recursiveness mm -hmm. is another one of those fundamental principles of creation in the universe that I absolutely adore because it just, it never stops. It keeps turning around. Fractals help the whole lot. There's a whole lot of the whole in the part, and the you can get the the hologram out of whatever it is. Those, I, I think those are very useful metaphors for me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, going through. But most people just go, just tell me what's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't, and no one can. You have to know. <laughs> you know, Mur Murray says that all the time. You know, like, yeah. Well, it reminds me of another. <laughs> Another thing that Heidegger said, uh, he wrote the other essay, um, What is Called Thinking, uh, mm. which uh, if I had to summarize it, uh, the line that pops out is he said the most thought provoking thing is that we are not yet thinking. Yeah. And <laughs> there's something of that. I mean, if, if you do a very crude transposition, you get from thinking to, to belief and we don't yet know what to believe. We don't right. yet know what's true. We don't yet know what really matters until we're pressed. Because when we're pressed, it, it really does, I think, come through pretty clearly. Uh, and you act in the way that you will, and that reveals what it was that you were presuming, what you believed. <laughs> uh, and um, I mean, that's, I think, part of the lesson th through Murray and what he describes as you know, the, the blues hero. is The blues hero is responding to a set of life conditions. So... There's not, there's no choice not to respond. You have to, you know, you have to turn those lemons into lemonade somehow or the other because there's no other way to go on unless you do. And that, those constraints force a certain kind of creativity and they force maybe a certain kind of clarity uh, in, and, 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 you know, boldness of, of thought or um, of sense of direction that in the, let's say, not as pressured um, you know, zones of, of, of culture, maybe the, the academic or the professional, you know, uh, worlds, uh, you can kind of stew a bit more and you could kind of circle around in those, you know, cycles of recursion and, and wondering. You don't have to commit. You don't have to commit mm -hmm. to, to, to something necessarily. You could spend a lot of time spinning your wheels uh, and, you know, spinning different kinds of metaphors for you know, how reality potentially could be and what you might or may not believe and what might or might not be worth doing. Um, but there isn't the sense of a, a real necessity or an immediacy that I think is actually could be really, really helpful when mm -hmm. we're, you're in a crisis, when in actuality, or at least this is a belief that I, I would um, propose, that there's a crisis situation, you know, that... that mm -hmm. And what that means is open. I, I'm not... Saying yeah. that's bad necessarily. No, no, but no, no. I, I'm saying that I, if I it, say I'm a big fan of crises, but you know, we we can't live without we can't live without a certain number of them, and we need them both personally and probably in a larger scale to remind us 
you know. But right. And, but if I if I but if I look at just in the very diffuse sense, like what's happening, what's going on in the world, what's going on in reality, what's really happening. Even if I don't know exactly what's happening, if this is some kind of prelude to a singularity that's going to like pop, you know, us all into an other dimension or what have you, whatever is going on, or if we're just going to continue on as humans, you know, merging somewhat with our machines and, um, you know, retaining our, our own uh, agency or re- retaining our own, you know, sense of you know, self distinct from some kind of larger you know, Borg or what have you, what, however this is going, right? And, and if, even if it, and if it is descending into, into real, you know, planet-wide type of implosion with, uh, you know, world, world warfare, um, cyber warfare, nuclear, I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios that we could paint. Um, but insofar as there is some intensification, right, as, as Gapeser put it, then Part of what that means for, for myself as a being in the world is that I want to be aware of what that is. I want to see the, the shape of it. I want to know where it's going. I want to kind of feel out, you know, how do I, how do I position myself? I have, a, I have a family, right? I have my own goals and, and desires. Uh, I want to live. I want to, cre- you know, create a, a good, um, you know, good, good, situation you know, i want people to be happy i want i want good name there's all kinds of desires that i have that may be threatened by this um by wider events right and so if i can understand what's going on on the widest on the, that that wider scale then i could act intelligently i can make i can make better choices uh and and the thing is it's a rabbit hole right because you start trying to ask those questions and you get ultimately you get to these ontological questions you, you start asking mm-hmm. really okay well who are we talking about and who's really behind all this who's bringing all of this about how wh- how how did we get to this point you know why why are things like this because if we could understand why then we could perhaps change it right we could we could um so the uh, infinite conversations idea what i hope we could do in this space is to have a kind of sandbox at first where the, the, all those cans of worms could be emptied out mm-hmm. and uh and they are squirmy worms they're, they're not pleasant uh all, all the time they're not i don't feel comfortable handling them half the time i actually uh for all of my jokes and my, my poking and prodding around this i don't like squirmy things i don't like gooey <laughs> sticky things <laughs> i i i, I I, I I wash my hands uh, mm. not religiously, but uh, if if uh, but obsessively, I, uh, well, sure. I, I, <laughs> I, I remember the, um, when I was a kid, uh, Sloterdijk was talking in his book about blankets and 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 towels and this kind of placental nature of yeah. the 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 things that we just presume are there to kind of keep us safe and. I had this thing called the emergency towel. So when I got into, you know, I was taking a bath and I got soap in my eyes or I got water on my face, I would cry out to my mom to get me the emergency towel uh, uh-huh. to, to wipe it off. And this is, you know, just an early childhood experience and, and memory. But uh, I, mean, I guess my, my, my point is that, uh, is that we do have to talk about what matters, but we don't know exactly what matters. However, if pressed, we we would disclose that uh mm-hmm. and so it's useful to create um i think uh situations where you know you have to in some way kind in some way you know show up right and mm-hmm. um maybe that's just a conversation like like we're having um maybe it's taking a creative risk uh and writing something putting something out that um you know, you don't totally understand uh, yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't know exactly where it came from, but it comes through you. It seems to have meaning. It seems to frame reality in a way that is um, insight is interesting or insightful or important uh, to you. And so you put it out and you get feedback on it. Other people mm-hmm. hear it, they re- respond to it or not. Maybe it's not that interesting, right? Maybe it's... Mm-hmm. Um, so this is me just spilling various worms in our sandbox. But part of what I wanted to think about, part of what, what I wanted to think through 
is how we construct the spaces that allow us to even have the conversations that matter and mm -hmm. to um, come to the beliefs that we need to about what's going, what's real, who we are, uh, what's going on in the world, and how we should act, uh, if we should act, because maybe, maybe we shouldn't. Like you, you talked a little bit earlier about um, the fundamentalists and mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, the, that worldview, which you, you would say isn't really getting us anywhere, uh, cool. that it's not worth really pressing or pursuing or further developing. But then what do you do about that? Do you write a bunch of books attacking uh, that mm -hmm. worldview? <laughs> do you, you know, try to, try to tear down the communities that, uh, that you know, would choose to believe those things? Maybe if you're somebody like um, uh, Richard Dawkins or, or one of the new atheists, yeah. you do. Uh, and, and that is part of what you are doing to affirm and assert your own beliefs about uh, reality. But then you and I or others from another perspective might say, well, that, that dynamic itself is a wasteful and inefficient and destructive dynamic. And maybe we should try a different tack. Maybe that's not getting us anywhere either. And... Um, I, I I, I agree. People people do things for the strangest reasons. I don't see that there's a dime's bit of difference between Dawkins and most fundamentalist Christians. Mm -hmm. They both have a rapidly, to my way of thinking, insane um, ontology that they absolutely have to pursue because it's the only one possible. Well, no. I mean, the mere fact that I think differently than either one of those goes, well, there's at least one other option. It may not, in their eyes, it's not a good one, but you know, what do I do in that case? I just let it go. I don't care. If you guys want to go beat your heads in, I'll help you find a space to go do it. If that's what you really want to do. But I, I don't have the time, energy or resources to deal with it. So I just, I go about my business. Mm -hmm. So I spend more time here with people who are at least tolerant when I'm curmudgeoning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they, they at least allow me to be that, even if they can come, they, and they're very free to do, and, and some do in, in their very gentle ways, go, you know, you're just being a curmudgeon. You know, well, okay, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm aware of that now. I thought so before, I felt that, but but some of these things are, are, are points that matter. And, and I think the thing, and that's the thing I like about Infinite Conversations is you can talk about things that matter. If you go in expecting that everybody's going to embrace what you think matters, you're probably in for a bit of a shock mm -hmm. because it's not that's not going to happen. But that doesn't happen anywhere, and it's not going to happen here. But what does happen here is people don't come to fisticuffs either physically or verbally. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at the number of people that are on this platform, and there hasn't been one one argument ad Hitlerum, you know, mm -hmm. we haven't got the Hitler and nothing, you know, and believe me, back in the old days, <laughs> oh, I know. On, on, news, on Usenet news groups, you got there sometimes within minutes, sometimes within hours, sometimes within days, but you got there. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those, you see, and that's not here because there is a certain, there's a certain ambiance in this place, you know, it's called infinite conversations that that's just, it's, it's, first of all, it's not cool, but it's not necessary. You, you can really disagree with what somebody else is saying and still get along. And it's one of the few places and those, and those places are very rare these days that people can exchange thoughts, feelings, ideas, notionalities, beliefs, that regardless of how they're clothed and, and not, and not have to fear that they're going to be torn to shreds in the next instance. Mm -hmm. And they may be rebuffed and they may feel bad and they may feel hurt. And you know, we, we all go away licking whatever little wounds we think we have, but nonetheless, it's still, this is still a place where that can happen. So being able to, to allow for that to tap, I, I think that's, that's, you know, like the best way for it. It's not a plan, 
but there's already a foundation there where one of the one of the fundamental beliefs, metaphysical beliefs, of infinite conversations as a as a as a place is it's open. Mm-hmm. That 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 is that's very important. It's very fundamental. It's open. Mm-hmm. It's not closed. It's open. People can come. They don't like it there. I'll go. Mm-hmm. I can come in. I can get out. I'm not under no obligation. I really don't have to. And I think that's an excellent start where mm-hmm. you can experience. I can throw something out. People have questions about it. They pointed me at this. Maybe it's helpful. Maybe it isn't. Maybe I'm going to ignore it. Maybe I think I know the answers to everything. Maybe I don't. It doesn't matter. But the decorum, the way we, we talk about it, one of the nice things is we have all of these talks out here. We we record all of this stuff and it's all posted. I'm sure people look at it at some time. I don't know how many do, but they get plenty of opportunities to see people like myself make absolute fools of themselves. Mm-hmm. And well, it certainly isn't the first time, and this isn't the first place, and it won't be the last one. Yeah, but nobody, I almost never know what I'm talking about. Honestly, nobody, I'm, I'm almost never, always purely yeah. hypothesizing. Probably, I, yeah, we do, and we do that a lot. But this is also that's another thing that's important. This is a place where you can throw things out. This is a place where we used to say you can run it up the flagpole and see if anybody salutes. Mm-hmm. You know? And if they don't, okay, then roll it back down. Uh, <laughs> there's a metaphor for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, yeah. yeah, I get. You know, I I think I think that's right. I don't know how that's how to really scale it. I think that what probably we were able to have the milieu that we do, the sense of decorum or civility that we do, because it's not too big, and it, most people are just not. I think paying attention. They don't really care. You know, they're yeah. they're uh, yeah. absorbed elsewhere. They yes. and. Uh, and I haven't taken too much, mm-hmm. I haven't done too much really to market it or promote it. And I haven't oh. really, uh, partly because like I was saying earlier, I just don't have the time. Partly because uh, I'd rather be spending, if I did have the time, I'd rather be spending it doing something else. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and um, partly because I think also that, kind of marketing creates it creates the space as much as it advertises at the space and yeah. uh partly it does that through its force of attraction through the sort of magic process it kind of what it does i mean part of what we have is a sort of magic circle right that, that you're describing like within this space uh we're just not going to do that we're not going to attack each yeah. other pointlessly you know if we do if it comes out because things happen, because we're not always, you know, we're not monadic subjects that are in control of all of our expressions um, all the time, especially when, you know, things get flowing, uh, we'll in some sense reconcile it. We'll, we'll, we'll try to absorb the, the, the con- we'll try to look at it, see what, what that is, mm-hmm. but then mm-hmm. ultimately, you know, not get stuck on it. Uh, I, 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 I would hope that that would be the case. But how does that scale? How does that become... A larger phenomena how does it go go from a bubble to foam <laughs> um that i don't exactly know however i think part of it has to do with that magic circle notion that there isn't a, a power to intention there's a power to belief mm-hmm. and um one of our uh, one one of our clients actually some somebody i do website development work although i've never spoken with with him personally is bruce lipton Mm-hmm. And Bruce Lipton, uh, in you know, if you were to categorize him in a genre, it'd be more in the New Age side. But he was a biologist. He wrote a book called *The Biology of Belief*, which is about how our beliefs affect our uh, our physical or what we mm-hmm. what we would call our physical uh, being uh, at at the genetic and epigenetic level. He was one of the proponents of epigenetics. Um, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I don't think I don't think he's taken too seriously within the hardcore materialist you know genetic science but he uh seems to do pretty well on the like the new age you know lecture circuit and all all kinds of events and he seems like a genuinely really nice guy actually Mm -hmm. Uh, and everybody that is around him they're all really nice and uh they are relaxed about their work they're happy they're loving uh 
there's something about the the ambiance around him and around the way that he's constructed his own, his own beliefs that uh, that creates that effect. And so, I mean, I'm ba- I'm kind of coming full circle and agreeing with with you earlier, even though uh, part of me uh, when you were talking about belief and the the idea of setting down your beliefs and working hard to really define what they are, uh, part of me was skeptical, right? I I, I had the a sort of I had a little person on my shoulder, uh, uh, like a little Michel Foucault sort of figure over here, um, you know, tr- trying to trace the ar- archaeological uh, genealogy of where that might be coming from and uh, how foolish it might be on some level. Um, but on another, part of, I think, what you're doing when you clearly define, articulate state, or as Murray would say, ex- extend, elaborate, and refine your mm-hmm. beliefs uh, into stories, statements, and uh, some sort of framework, even uh, if you want to call it that, uh, for living, is um, it's a magic act, right? Mm-hmm. And part of it's mm-hmm. a magic act, and part of it's creating the the energy, the fields around you. You know, it's creating the milieu, the ambiance around you. So if you take care to do that well. And observe what the effects are of different of different beliefs, uh, mm-hmm. and if that becomes a matter of what people communicate about, because we're, those our, our beliefs are always playing off each other, right? They're always creating they're creating meshes, you know, of, of fields. And I mean, I think that that we might just be at the stage in this in the genesis of this whole platform or what have you where we're working out the magical levels of it we're working out the 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 core fundamental elemental assumptions which are living are are living in forces or living intensities right and if we don't get that right you know if if we kind of have um confusion there or uh unexamined assumptions there that will throw everything off that comes later any structure we would build around it, any narrative that we would spin uh, about what we're doing or about what the space is about, any economics that would be a part of it. I mean, really, everything would be thrown off. So I guess, I mean, part, sometimes I feel that, th- that there's a sort of deficiency, like it's my own deficiency. Like I just don't know how to do what I you know, envision doing. Or there's problems with the technology. It's not as intuitive as it could be, or, or what have you. Um, but, uh, and I get, and I feel bad about that. Like I, I would rather it otherwise. I wish everything worked smoothly. I wish we had, you know, our, our business plan, uh, and um, uh, you know, our, our uh, even our legal uh, stature uh, taken care of. Uh, but it may be that in having conversations that are confusing that really I mean, are not even interesting uh, to, to most people, uh, we're working on fundamental things that are going to really serve us later on. Mm-hmm. And here we have all these videos that we've, we, we've read books, uh, and there's been a confluence of, uh, I think, different um, influences. I mean, in the same space, we have Albert Murray and a whole sort of connection to uh, a, mu- a musical tradition, artistic tradition in jazz and the blues, uh, and not just through Greg, but others who, you know, have tapped into those, tapped yes. into those currents as well. Uh, we have Sloterdijk, we have Gibbser, we have uh, poetry that's been brought in, uh, mm-hmm. and it hasn't all congealed. It hasn't all cohered into like a clear metaphysics like a clear story but uh but somehow it's in the process of clarifying itself i think i mean mm-hmm. i think that's part of what's i i, I think it is you know I, I tutored strategy for on an mba program for about 13 years and strategy is allegedly all about becoming the best in the market or the number one or whatever it is and I always tried to encourage my students to think of it differently. Strategy is the, is the answer to the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? 
And that's all there is to it. There's really nothing more than that. And in the course of your life, that, that will change. You're going to start off. I always, I took myself an example. Of course, when I was a young kid, I wanted to be a, a fireman and a policeman. And, you know, they walk around, they have uniforms on and everybody shows them respect. A lot of these things have changed in the meantime. But then you also, at an early age, realize, well, policemen get shot and sometimes it's dangerous. And then you ask yourself, eh, I don't know if I'm that kind of a, a hero. Maybe I can do something else and, and, and we change. And, and, and it wasn't, it didn't take too long till I decided I, I wanted to become a teacher. And so, and that kind of guided what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. And so all of the actions that I took consciously and unconsciously were actually directed towards that end. Mm-hmm. You know, Johnny would call it a, an outcome. I could call it an objective. I could call it a strategic goal. I don't really think that matters at, at that moment. It's something you just work toward. And it's not linear. You certainly don't just go, okay, oh, and I'm off and I'm there. Um, I think I had mentioned in that, that post once, I had signed up to be a math major until a month before I was to show up. And I changed to English because I, for whatever reason, I felt differently. Mm-hmm. Say, and in 1967, people didn't have different feelings about things like that. Mm-hmm. But I called and I said, oh, I'm going to be an English major. And they go, yeah, but your schedule's set. We can't change you. I said, that's okay. So I took computer programming and physics and, you know, I failed computer programming, barely made it through physics because I wasn't interested anymore. It's not that I had no mathematical ability. I just was not interested because my focus had moved to somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And you, you follow that. And so most of what, and, and this applies in the business world as well, you have to n- want to know what you want to be as a business. Mm-hmm. And you have to know what's coming out of it. Now, if you subscribe to the current ide- ideology that the purpose of business is the maximization of profits, then you already know what your strategy is. Mm-hmm. You have no choice. There is no alternative. That's the, that is, these, and these are the people who go, there is no alternative. Yeah, if you take that presumption, then you have no alternative. You must make money. Mm-hmm. Now, Peter Drucker said the purpose of business is to fulfill needs in markets, which meant that you needed to decide and define, well, what do you understand as a market and how do you understand needs? Mm -hmm. And how does whatever it is that you're doing, how does whatever it is that you're doing fit in with that? Mm -hmm. And he said, and if you're not a complete idiot, my words, not Peter Drucker's, he's much more tactful than I am, you will also make money because... Money is the, the lifeblood of business. You, you, we all live from something. It's like the food. Mm-hmm. If, if, we don't, if we live for food, we're obese. Mm-hmm. We, we're, but we're not people anymore. We actually don't do anything. You know, we just sit there and we're Java the Hutt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what we end up. Okay? So all of those pictures are there, but you, but you decide. So, and, and I see that's what's happening in the, in the, the current process. You know, well, well, how do we structure them? Those are good thoughts to have. You have people mm. that are contributing to those. You can't yeah. do them all at once. But you do have a kind of general idea of what you want to be when you grow up. And that's probably enough for the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't need to be concretized any more than that. Mm-hmm. You know? And, that, and that's the problem that too many businesses, I believe, fall into and all the case studies that we've ever done in, in the course of my, my tutoring and these things all pointed to the fact that once you lose sight of what you want to be when you grow up, it goes south anyway. Mm-hmm. And in most cases, you never knew what you wanted to be to begin with. And so you, were, you just end up, you're good for a while and it can go good for a while. And you can, and you can, <laughs> you can die a violent death. <laughs> that's also possible you see? because you you took your eye off the ball you weren't paying attention when you needed to you zigged when you should have zagged because you weren't pursuing whatever that was and that's not an obsessive pursuing you know all roads to the goal are like this <laughs> and they take a long time <laughs> mm. the more like knots than they are paths you know Brian George uh, says that the shortest um, distance between two points is a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I agree. I would agree wholeheartedly. Hit the nail on the head. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I got in here, but I don't know how to get, I know where I want to go. I have no idea how to get there. And that's the, and that's the thing that we tell ourselves most of the time. I have no idea how to do this. 
Well, you don't have to have an idea how to do this. You know what you want to do. And this is why I write down my beliefs every once in a while. If I have certain beliefs and I write them down, I'm one of these people that, you know, um, I never took notes on a computer. I, I, I type a lot, but I do most things longhand mm -hmm. because writing reinforces all the neural pathways and blah, 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 and whatever. So I, I tend to write things down. I'll scribble them down somewhere. I have a little notebook I carry around, usually in my, my vest or, or whatnot pocket. It's just a real little whatever. And I mm -hmm. scribble stuff in there. That's yeah. where I scribble. That's exactly uh, what I have. Yeah, I have one. There you go. Let's see. <laughs> but once they're scribbled down, I'll think about them, cogitate on them, and then they end up in the other book. Mm-hmm at some point, because then I'll, I have thought about them. I refined them. I've, I've given it more consideration and then I'll write that down and in writing it down, I internalize it a little mm -hmm. more. So right. those, although it would be interesting to see what the evolution of some of my beliefs have been, I'm not sure that they have taken wide swaths mm -hmm. or they've gone to great places, but I have a much more comfortable feeling about what I believe. And when I encounter things, flags go up because that's not something you believe. Do you want to, you know, accept, reject, or get out of here? You know? mm -hmm. Well, generally, I'll, like any good dog, I'll sniff around the lamppost and see who was there and what they're up to and, you know, but knowing full well that you can also get sucked in, in the tide, just in the back of my mind, you know, right. there's a real good vortex going on in there. You could get sucked in. Mm -hmm. We have to approach these things with caution, but not with trepidation. Mm -hmm. And most people just go, oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Squat. <laughs> and I manage to get through life, you know. <laughs> and the older I get, the less I know. And actually, the happier I am that there's a lot of things I thought I knew. I'm glad I don't know anymore mm -hmm. you know, because I've forgotten those. But, but these processes are not as cut and dried and as and as clearly definable and describable as we would like them to be mm -hmm. as well. You know? But, but you, you described this a kind of model, right? Because in your own process, you have a little notebook. Yeah. Uh, so as things come into your mind, you, you jot them down. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, if I'm out yeah. walking and something occurs to me, a particularly um, poignant phrase or, or something I want to remember to do or what have you, I just write it down. Yeah. Uh, and then from here, I have another notebook as well, and mm -hmm. I'll do a different kind of writing there, but there's a, a filtration, there's a refinement that, that goes there. But still, that stuff is rough. And, yes. uh, and then my interactions online will yes. introduce uh, ideas, phrases, what have you, that have occurred to me uh, earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'll also pick things up. Uh, from others, and oh. that will enter into my my whole process. I, I I wonder how that scales. Like I wonder if there's a way that you could look at a, a forum or a discussion space as one part of a uh, a sort of refinement or filtration process where the conversations form a kind of milieu or they form mm -hmm. a kind of soil out of which other things ultimately grow. I mean, the point of talking is not just to talk. I mean, I enjoy talking, actually, with, with you and with uh, the others. There, there's something just inherently enjoyable about that. But if we were just talking, and if it wasn't leading to something, if we weren't uh, trying to create something or to um, bring something forth in the world, objectively, uh, between us and more broadly, then I think we'd ultimately lose interest because you know, things, something would happen that would draw our attention that would make it, that would be more urgent, you know, be more important and urgent. So uh, I think part of what would be useful to conceive is the sort of ecosystem of how conversations can flow into other things that people want to do or bring forth. For me as a writer, for example, it's really useful to talk about things like we talked about now, about nothing, about metaphysics, about nihilism, because these are concerns that I actually deal with in my writing. If, if I'm writing a poem, and that poem is in some way the equivalent to me of writing down my beliefs, it's mm -hmm. like, this is what's most real to me, I'm, and it takes the shape of a poem, 
That's actually fairly accurate, I would say. I don't really write down my beliefs, but my poetry concretizes my real sense of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, therefore, it's a very important work. It's the most important work. Mm -hmm. But the process of having these conversations is, um, uh, is important to that. Like, it, it's part of what is clarifying what I ultimately will create, which then... I'll share and post and publish and, and so forth. So it can become part of what other people take in and mm -hmm. use or not use in their own uh, process of clarification and self, self realization. Uh, mm -hmm. think. So, but that, that's you know, how to, how to really describe that because that's not what social media is about. Uh, th <laughs> that, <No. laughs> and, you know, that might be what um, school is about, right? That, that was the idea of a liberal arts humanistic education is that you would read mm -hmm. books, you would talk about them, and you would form your own ideas and you would form your own path to become toward becoming a generative contributor to that larger conversation, to the evolution of, of culture. Mm -hmm. And I, th I mean, what I think is the case in the larger instances that institution is not is kind of broken down uh mm -hmm. the internet provides all kinds of tools and all kinds of pockets and spaces where that kind of thing happens um but on the larger scales of the social media world and the ways that we tend to interact we the more broad we not just you and i but sort of our networks or our culture is uh in spaces that are not really designed to facilitate or support that sort of cr multi-dimensional creative process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where we have a space that's open as you put it where we can run things up the flagpole where we could dump out our cans of worms where we could you know mm -hmm. separate the wheat from the chaff or the, any number of metaphors yeah. that, that we can use oh, yeah. but <laughs> but where the space itself and we talked about this as well in the forum where the space itself is um I want to say structured or it's I mean it's not a static space either no. that that would be the thing it's more of a it sort of has a, a, a meta current that's leading toward refining our our points of view and mm -hmm. bringing things forth that are that are of higher value and that are of uh, of uh, greater depth I think although although I'll maybe not that I mean, de depth is another another notion um when you were talking earlier about getting kind of going to the point where depth isn't no longer there there is mm -hmm. uh just the uh, you know you're just sort of popped into space um but that is so, an intensification even when you come out the other side <laughs> 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 and it may be that that intensification was too intense and that's mm. why you, you let it go mm. you know that, that's, that's where, really why i like that I, I'm not so much into the spatial, but I know we're trying to get to the bottom of things and all our language is just made for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, that's the way we've developed it in practically all our Western languages. I don't know anything about Eastern languages. Mm -hmm. but, um, well, Eastern, the far Eastern languages. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn biblical Hebrew right now. Believe me, that's a whole different way of looking at reality. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so can, can I, but, can you ask how much time do you have time? Do you, uh, do you need to, uh, I noticed somebody came in the door, and the, you. No, they no. My wife just closed the door because um, uh, the grandson. We have to bring it. Well, grandma was going to bring him to bed tonight, but summertime in Germany is a tough time to bring a kid to bed. It's yeah. pretty hard in the winter. It's really easy. It's dark outside. You got to sleep. But in the summer, where it's light here forever, then eh, not so much. So, hard to make that argument. Yep. Hard to make yeah. the argument that it's bedtime when it's still light out. Yeah. Yeah. And and. and Although we try, it is, it's parents' anniversary today, and they went out to dinner, so, you know, we're kind of, but he, he does good to be with grandma, because grandma tells him stories, mm. and so, and so they decided he, he needed a change of venue from upstairs, where it's close to his bed, <laughs> mm. and so they came down here, so that they could kind of avoid that. Okay. Do, do you have I a few minutes? Could we go like another 20 minutes? Uh, yeah, I have my, my mother-in-law visiting along with a niece and they're going to be leaving uh, in a couple of hours. So we're going to have lunch 
yeah, at the top of the no, hour. We, we um, but We're flexible in that regard. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I wanted to share a couple of things with you. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're kind of coming from a more diffuse space. They're more associative. Uh, mm. but, uh, but I think that they are examples of what we've been talking about and um, just interesting convergences in this space. One of, so it's the work of two poets. And uh, the first one is named Michael Aaron Kamins. Uh, we haven't published uh, any of his work yet, but we're, we're going to be doing so. And I'm working with him on, I guess, figuring out a presentation, how to present his sort of larger project. But it's called, uh, the, the, let, me, let me actually look it up and, and read it accurately uh, to you. One second. Transderivational searches in absentia. Okay, I'll say that again. Transderivational searches in absentia. And this is the name that he's given to sort of a meta project that he's working on poetically, uh, which is composed of these sort of multiple layers or dimensions of, um, of, of being or, or of metaphor uh, that uh, contain each other like holarchically. It's a sort of post-metaphysical metaphysics or a pataphysics it's it's a i think an example of um of the sort of realm of possibilities on the other side of maybe both the negative nothing and the positive nothing and mm -hmm. and part of why i think it came to mind is because the name of the first book in this in this of of voir is called absences and the premise of absences uh, is that it's a text that is um, describing and arising out of this space in which all meaning, uh, all you know, pure presences, uh, all just you know, entities in this sort of metaphysical sense of concrete beings is, uh, has been vacated. And so all you're left with are these sort of like you know, this play of voids. Uh, and, and, and that play of voids is structured in uh, three layers. Uh, the first one is called lines. The second one is called globes. And the third one is called code. And as Michael described this to me, the, the, um, the lines are kind of the simplest sort of, you know, dimensionality. Uh, the, the globes contains the lines and the code contains the globes. And then absences is contained in this um, sort of larger structure uh, that he calls clouds. And the clouds are these, you know, spaces, uh, you might say, you know, that are kind of hybrid or, or overdetermined. They, they include the technological sense of clouds, like we're right now talking on Zoom cloud, <laughs> quote unquote. Yeah. Um, but it can also have this sort of broader sense of a cloud of um, a sort of cloud of consciousness uh, in, the, in the mystical uh, sense, a cloud of unknowing. Uh, and uh, and his, con his premise or his, his sort of uh, working hypothesis, you might say, or his generative and creative uh, hypothesis is that in the post-metaphysical, in the space after metaphysics, uh, we kind of have to create our own or construct our own uh, spaces. And this is his poetic uh, attempt to, to do so. And part of what, uh, the, the, the other thing here is that he sees this morphologically, his project, as enacting uh, something similar to what... Uh, the, the, the Kabbalistic um, tree of life does as well. It's, it's describing or invoking an image of reality. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not just a kind of, rea it's not just a representation of reality. If you really enter into or let yourself mm -hmm. into that image, that metaphor, if you will, uh, it becomes constitutive of your reality. Your, your real reality. And so the poetic act for, for Michael uh, 
involves doing so, it involves doing that hard work of really defining, like you, you said, your beliefs. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, what's interesting is though, it's not a simple or naive metaphysics. It's one mm-hmm. that is recursive in the sense of being aware of its own ephemerality or its own um, maybe spacelessness, its own nothingness. Uh, there, there's something that is happening here that's on the other side of that metaphysical uh, conceit. So that that's one just project. I just want to put that forward as, and even for anybody who might listen to this or, or, or view this later, it's sort of a, a preview. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to juxtapose it with another uh, work that uh, I recently was um, has been was shared with me, and it's a poet. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull him up. Just one second. Uh, I want to, I'm, I'm pulling him up because I want to pronounce his name correctly. Uh, Yahia Lababidi. And the work that he just shared with me uh, is a book of aphorisms, uh, not aphorisms, of, um, yes, exactly, and aphoris, aphorisms, which are, are, are basically just kind of short, Mm-hmm. takes on what is true what mm-hmm. what can you how how succinctly can you state uh, a working like assumption some truth that you mm-hmm. could actually use right in, in your life and the quality is almost like the, the the quality of the work is almost completely different because one seems to be coming from a very mm-hmm. um i don't know how to put this but but uh wholesome place uh not a place of absences like actually kind of a world of presences and the other is coming from a world from a world of absences but somehow i feel that they have something to do with each other and our conversation here today uh has kind of juxtaposed them for me so i Mm -hmm. kind of want to actually share with you if it's okay if you have a moment uh an example from each okay and I want to like ask the meta question of like what is of what is a space in which two such divergent works coexist? Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start just by showing you uh, this work absences. Mm-hmm. Just, just a second. Just a second. What's up? Okay. Yeah. And now it's the worst time. Okay. And just a minute, I'll be right out. I have like five more minutes. I just wanted to say. Yeah, okay. That's all right. Okay. I'll be right out. (laughs) Yeah, I'll be just trying to walk. Oh, it's okay. You want to say goodnight? Say goodnight. Hi. Is it bedtime already? Is it bedtime? That's what you want to know, huh? Yeah, it's late. Oh, yeah. Well, sweet right. dreams. Okay, so say nighty night again. Yeah. We'll see you in a minute. Bye bye. Yeah, that works from your house. Yeah, I'll yeah. come out then. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. So. So here's the book absences. Yeah. Each of these we could say is like a point of nothing, right? Negative nothing, positive nothing. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. Uh, and. And then the structures in the absence are the lines, lines, globes, and codes. So I'm just going to pick one of these out to give a sense of what the poetics is like here. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's uh, uh, very different uh, than um, most things I've read, actually. So this, one's, this one just starts here. There's no titles, okay? I'm just going to read it. Okay. Polyglobes, geocentric ghosts, pop shot molecules, fat veins, flat veins of constellation fossils, negated cosmoses, reversible bubble double negative being in absentia, drug globes with skull cults and traffic lines, and being metabolized in narcosphere. High. 
ghost policed and pulverized, in absentia, electrochemical circles, in full global withdrawal, in metabolites of absence out, rubber doubles detoxify and ejaculate, in negated unreal globe of ghost forms and alien frosts, in fuck webs of instant death, in afterlife nets of sex death fantasies, at home globe arcades of prostitution, with crippling prosthetics and hunks, husks of time, in absentia, of slipping mantles of exposed globes, in permanent hypothermic catastrophe, frozen bubbles and quasi-crystal globes of extraterrestrial origin, in greenlit zones of capsuled lunacy, global profiteers of war, prophets of deep abgrund, of, and dealers of absence, in sleep light, of absentee globe lords, proliferating hypodermic deep freeze, in absentia astral rings and alien death globes, all night intercourse and morning rigor mortis, accumulating absences, hallucinatory singularities and paucity of forms, in major terror spheres and minor, minor remedial medial recessed solaces, all stuck with pins and needles, of new vicarious voodoos, in absentia and old cartoons, of being. And uh, many of them are kind of like this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which the way I'm reading it, and I'm just get, becoming familiar yeah. with the work. Yeah. I, I really have did not, I did not know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, didn't even That's thought, thought there's almost, maybe there's nothing that, to make there. Like part of what I thought, well, if these are just all absences, what's what's to you know what what, what why, why bother <laughs> right <laughs> um but the reason what what i what what it caught on is that and the reason i came back and became interested is because there was a certain an incantatory quality there was an intensity in other words mm -hmm. uh that seemed to be describing a certain kind of experience in a certain kind of place that okay is a, maybe a hyper-mediated sphere, a hyper-real sphere. Like, it, it, maybe it's a sphere that will become more and more normal to us the further into the future we get, the further we get into this you know, technological revolution or what have you. But it's coming from a certain kind of place. And, uh, and I think that, in, much like you were saying earlier about uh, the, the, um, the Ein Soft, where you could just say the word and something can get it, you know, know what you mean it may be that no this is completely meaningless <laughs> to uh to you know most most readers but if someone knows the the, the nothingness right mm -hmm. uh, of of the uh, of in the in the kind of wasteland of metaphysics <laughs> you could say mm -hmm. this might be what reality looks like there right mm -hmm. and and what's interesting though is that this is just part of a larger unfolding mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. goes from these absences to clouds uh, to potentially other structures that for the poet and potentially for the reader creates a sense of reality that that um, may sustain one in some way like maybe yeah. may, may, yeah. may um, pr provide some orientation so uh, there, there's another poet, though, uh, who's has a which I'll share. With, I'll share this little piece um, that he shared with me, and I'll, I'll after that I'll, I'll let you respond. Okay. So we're kind of going meta. We're going to have a juxtaposition of of aesthetics. Okay. I'm going to have to share my screen to do this. Um. So there's going to be just a moment of technical. Adjustments. Okay. Okay. Let me know when you see my screen. I see your desktop. Well, okay. it's cleaned up since the last time I saw. Oh uh, yeah, I've been been uh, hacking away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. I want to make sure that we're going to be. You can hear the audio. Okay, let me know if you hear the audio on this video. We're at the trail. 
I can hear something in the background, but I can't quite hear it. Okay, then let me adjust something here quick. Oh, I did this last time when we talked with Greg. So let's see. I'm going to try this again. Let's see if you hear it. Oh, okay. Actually, one second. Do you hear that? Hmm. Okay, well, this might not work then. I'll have to send you a link. The, uh, the name of the work is Where Epics Fail, Aphorisms on Art, Morality, and Spirit. And um, maybe I can find something to share here. Excerpt. Where epics fail, or where technology fails, or where my my use of technology fails. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm gonna have to figure this out. I apologize for that. No problem. No problem. You can send me a link. I can take a Yeah. Um. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. There's a setting to stream the audio when you're sharing your screen, and that's what's not, doesn't seem to be working. Um, but, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there was one thing in, in what you read, Jesus, and maybe it was the content that you read, but, um, and I got one primary feeling from all the things that you said, mm -hmm. and that was hollowness. Mm -hmm. This hollowness I found interesting because the first person I thought of was Slobodan. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the images that came up were very ref reflective of things that we see in our everyday degraded, um, uber capitalistic, uh, drug induced, uh, poverty stricken, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot of that there, and so it was this. I'll, I'll call it the theme of hollowness that that flowed through there, that that tied that all together in a way that I generally don't find. In, in that kind of a presentation. Mm -hmm. presentation. So, um, you know, having heard that, I would I would be interested in seeing more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think that hollowness would correspond to the absences and to yeah. Uh, yeah. this, you know, this this sense that you know Johnny mentioned on the forum of 
a kind of you know, dump or a heap of uh, of signifiers or just the, the mess of you know d- different kinds of communications that don't mean anything don't add up to anything uh that you know at some level you know if we're looking at it critically is really just about companies making profits mm-hmm. there'd be no reason to you know create all this all this kind of thing if that wasn't the, the motivation behind it uh in other cases it's just pure in a sense pure pure foolishness or or mm-hmm. lostness like just not knowing better not having anything better to to, to put out uh, and incredible amounts of resources, time, energy, attention, money, et cetera, flows in those directions. You know, at mm-hmm. the same time that, you know, we, we know from, you know, objectively that uh, we're in a difficult spot, you know, we're in a crisis type situation on a, on, on a global scale, on a social scale, uh, that, you know, things are happening fast and, we we need to you know as as conscious human beings like we need to react we need to be responsible because there are things that are in, are in our care uh mm. and i mean that's um so i mean that that's part of uh that's part of why it's important to i guess read you know and to and, and to um you know ha, 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 be able to read like to because our reading of books reading of texts like po- it, part of it is training right it's also like yes. reading oh, yes. uh, it's training for reading reality yeah and the esoteric tradition they talked about two great books that one had to had to learn to read the book of man and the book of nature mm-hmm. uh, the, the metaphor has been around for a long time and it encapsulates exactly that what you were saying yeah we and, and so that i mean that's part of why i f- i feel like a text like this uh, is not the kind, actually, that that I would would have read either necessarily. Mm-hmm. Right, and but there was something about it, yeah. and uh, part of what I think it is is that it's a re- it's a reading of a certain kind of a certain reality, and it 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 gives a way I think to um, encounter it, maybe enfold it. I mean, just as the author is doing, the author is enfolding this, these absences in larger structures. And perhaps part of like the cultural work that a space like Infinite Conversations might be doing is enfolding uh, all kinds of experiences into structures that can be more, um, that can be leading towards something, right? That, uh, bec- that, can be leading ultimately, hopefully, you know, toward a better world in some way. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be naive or put that in uh, to idealistic terms, but uh, but what else? You know, why else would we be? What else should we be doing? Uh, mm-hmm. and what <laughs> what other? If we're not doing that, then why wouldn't? We, what what are we doing? Right. Mm-hmm. So there there's some role I think for. Even something as esoteric and weird and associative as this, as absences, in mm-hmm. in a larger project, uh, and to me, it's important that the way that the larger project is framed and understood allows for it, like allows for absences as much mm-hmm. as the presences of the the piece that I wanted to share. Uh, by by Yahia Lababidi, which is coming from almost, almost completely different place. It's it's mm-hmm. very interesting, and yet they both to me contain wisdom. Mm-hmm. They they both to me contain something that I need to pay attention to, like mm-hmm. if I want to have a clear sense of the whole. Okay. No. Uh, and. I think that ties in well with the openness that I spoke of for you. So you can allow these things in, and I don't. I don't see anything in this that would like that would that would make this explode, or that would that would tear this apart, or that would that would make it so disconcerted that that no one would be interested anymore. Because mm. there there has one of the things that openness does is it teaches us to to encompass more of what we normally wouldn't mm-hmm. and that and that's exactly what you were you're doing here 
um, when you're open, you're, you're willing to give it a chance, not knowing what it is. Well, I'll take a look at it. Mm-hmm. And I can go, okay, doesn't turn my crank. And the guy sitting next to me or the gal is going, well, I ain't never read anything. It was so fantastic. Well, I now have somebody I need to talk to. See? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, that forces that conversation. Yeah. Because, and that's why I like our slow to die conversations because you folks that are more positively disposed to them than I am, let us say, um, bring a lot out that I wasn't aware of. That mm-hmm. I, I overlooked it for whatever reasons, be it my curmudgeonry or be it by, simply because I was pissed at the time. You know? Yeah. So and so, I think but, it's necessary to have that 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 complement those you know those those extensions. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, the, the discernment is also important, right? So, um, I mean, part of having openness and having the milieu and having a magic circle is those those boundaries right and i just read that poem there was nothing about it that like you said to me seemed like it was dis- destructive would be destructive you know of yeah. uh of the space uh and whereas there could be things that would be you know that w- that, we would that not would really be, want I, to i saw that as a very nice example of that uh, positive negative uh, you know <laughs> mm-hmm. negativity kind of thing that we were talking about earlier right know, because it was simply it it, it, it felt very descriptive so, mm-hmm. so like i look this is what i saw mm-hmm. i think part of it also is that we have di- each person has their own their own sort of complex of receptivities and sensitivities yeah. so things that i'm sensitive to or receptive to you might not be other things that you are i might not be and there's an ensemble ensemble effect where because I sense something that may be a value or that may be a threat, uh, and I can communicate that to others who may not have that those sensibilities, and then vice versa, that there's an intelligence that we begin to network in, in effect. Yes. Uh, yes. And we especially, by doing so, can harness our individuality because you don't have to like what I do or sense what I do as long as we respect what each other likes and senses and treat that as potentially valuable information and something we may become sensitized to uh, through, the, through the translation that you may offer me, you know, what about that, what shape, what size, where, uh, the kind of modeling that we might do about how we experience what we do. Uh, and, uh, and then the, meta, the, the meta-modeling and the mesh modeling, uh, I think that that's what infinite conversation is kind of like allows us to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we just need to do more of it and better yeah. and better. And I, it's, I it's a, it's a, it's a practice actually. It's something yeah. that we, we can do better yeah. if we just keep doing it and learning from our, you know, from our experiences. I, I agree as well. And, and one of the other things that you, you are doing I think all of us are, is we reflect on our own actions and the things that we do to see how how we can improve on them or make them more effective or make them uh, more accessible to a, maybe a wider audience. But um, a part of what you're we're, you're looking to do is to reach a particular critical mass where where it can take on a, a, a dynamic of its own, and that mm-hmm. and that takes time and and doesn't you know it doesn't happen overnight. That is a, a time-based kind of thing, but and I'm not sure, especially when one is young, like infinite uh, conversations is, that um, I always find advertising to be a very um, hard-handed approach to to getting people's attention. You know, I'm 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 very very sensitive to advertising. You know, one one of the things I I really like about German television is you know when the commercials come, mm-hmm. and they they they, they come in, in either in the middle or at the end. And then when I was first here in Germany, they were allowed to be broadcast. The two there were two ten minute periods in the day where commercials could be broadcast. Period. End of story. Mm-hmm. So if you weren't there for those ten minutes, you didn't get them. Mm-hmm. Now now they've edged them in between a couple of programs. And in the middle of a couple of others, but it's also in the same window when those ten minutes were allowed before. Right. But 
but it's a whole different approach to that because we're so bombarded by by stimuli all the time. You know, I like to choose every once in a while which stimuli I want to be bombarded by. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, our, our sense of appropriateness has completely yeah. changed. Uh, yeah. And so, and and so, I feel that that in in you know, you have a lot a lot of people are coming in from a lot of different places. Um, people that I've heard of, names I haven't heard of yet as well, they get mentioned here, and I say, oh, okay, well, there is there is a certain amount of coalescence that's going on. There are people finding their way in, and those who, who resonate with what's happening will will stay and and will contribute, and those who don't will flow off. And but I think on the whole, there's there's a, you know a general general positive momentum, even that may not be um, as, as as rapid as you might like it to be at the moment. Um, I think once it starts getting even more rapid, you're probably long for the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm already pretty much at my limit. Uh, that that, that I, need to, <laughs> I need we need I need to jump to a higher order where yeah. uh, things are being taken care of by by others that you know be, uh, because you know that that allows me not to have to deal with them and just yes, you know, yes, trust yes. that it's it's taken care of. Uh, simple things and some of it could be technological. Like for example, we're having this call. After this, uh, at some point, I'm going to have to download the recording. Then I'm going to upload it to another service that will balance out the audio. That has an automation which will send it to YouTube and to Google Drive and a couple of other places. But there has to be a description attached to it, a title, uh, yeah. some metadata, etc. So there's there's actually a whole series of steps behind the, the scenes, and that takes time, right? Uh, it takes some thinking too because you need to somewhat like frame what the conversation was about, give it a title. Uh, in some way, create the hook for others to yeah. decide whether or not they're even interested in it. Uh, and I can only do so much. So in some way, like that whole process, if there are going to be more conversations, and especially if it's going to be decentralized, so it's not just me, it's not always people talking to me in some sense, uh, but people talking to each other in a fractal yes. way, that all needs to be built in, in some right? Yes. It needs to be yes. coded in. And insofar as there's human effort required to make any of it move, that needs to be defined. Those humans need to be identified, uh, and they probably need to be paid <laughs> in some right uh, to to scale it. Um, but what I think is important is sort of to model the bigger picture because we want to have a lot of conversations. We want them to be meaningful and interesting. We want them to have a certain ethic or ethos or uh, you know civility to them at the minimum. Right. Uh, and they could be about any number of different things, right? It doesn't just have to be about German philosophy. <laughs> it could mm -hmm. you know, be a, comic books, sports. Uh, I don't care. I mean, really, any t topic mm -hmm. uh, can be fruitful and can be interesting. Yeah. Uh, and and then somehow they need to filter, right? So that pieces can begin to find each other, syntheses can begin mm -hmm. to happen. Um, yeah. yeah. And we get that ensemble or that net the network or ensemble effect of minds coordinating with each other in an open space. Yeah. So that is a long-term process. Uh, and part of it... For my long-term is a relative term. Long-term is relative. That's true. Yeah. That's true. What's long-term for you isn't necessarily long-term. That was what the first... Also, second lesson with my strategy students. What's long-term? Because there was a time when long term was defined by banks, uh -huh. insurance, and it was ten and twenty years was the horizon. Yeah. Now, now in those industries themselves, it's down to the next quarter where I have to publish my figures. That's right. Which is no longer in any stretch of, by any stretch of the imagination long term. That's right. Which means they have no, they cannot by definition have a strategy. Right. <laughs> so they're just they're just lumbering along. I and to me those are zombies. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Long term. Pretty I mean, the sense of a sense of. I have to think about my own life, right? And like yeah. what what uh, what long term is for me. Yeah. What do I want to be when I grow up? Exactly. <laughs> uh, but 
yeah, you know, I, I think it's helpful to think in terms of a few months, up to a couple mm-hmm. of years, up to maybe, you know, 10, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and then beyond that, it starts to get a bit speculative. Right. Uh, it, gets, it gets metaphysical it's beyond that. Human beings, and it is for corporate entities or companies or whatever. But, you know, but those are the things we, we've all tended to push aside and we now ignore because the purpose of business is the maximization of profits. All right. You know, so we eliminate it all. We don't have to worry about it anymore. It's, I guess that's why they, well, that's not why they fired me, but that is, uh, uh, they fired every one of us who were on the continent. The university was an English university and retreated to the island. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I said. Hmm. But I had a few nice discussions about exactly these kinds of things before, before we left. Because if you're going to teach strategy, you got to have one yourself. That was my big point. And I was getting yelled at for criticizing. You, know? <laughs> you don't have one. <laughs> Retreating to the island isn't a strategy. It's a defensive tactic. You know, <laughs> even in Clawitzian terms. So, so I don't know if we have any. Know. I don't. I haven't really come across some any great strategies, like real meta strategies. No, uh, it's it's what you want to be when you grow up, and you you make you you conceive it as you go along. You have a general idea. You know, to me, it concretized itself around a teacher, but in in actuality, I just ever, only ever wanted to be a good person. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's that vague, but but if I if I think about my life and where I am now, the the most painful moments I've ever had and the most pleasant moments I've ever had have all resolved revolved around that very item, being mm. a good person. When I failed to do so or when I managed to do so. Mm. But but that's it. And everything else, everything else, my professional life, my whatever that that all fell into place hmm. you know i can see in hindsight that the rest of it was was just means to ends and, and some other time we can talk about why i think that's that way because it's also part of my belief system of how i think the cosmos works hmm. but <laughs> but you see i might be just be extrapolating from my own personal experience and need drastic revision of that hmm. but for now that's the working hypothesis we have I'm working with that. All right. Well, I think I should head off. Yes. My, uh, my mother-in-law and uh, is going to be leaving in 45 minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think you, you got to be there for the hellos and the goodbyes at any rate. Yeah, you, that's right. You can't always be there in between. Yeah. Uh, we had a good time, actually. That We went we went on a hike. Uh, we went up to a little town called Netherland. If you ever come to Colorado, it's one of the most nice little places it's it's maybe 10 miles up the canyon from boulder but it, it hasn't become uh, affluent uh, oh, it, okay. it, it hasn't um hasn't really it's taken on that sort of shiny glow of of money yeah so there it still has the feel of a mountain town of colorado mountain town and there's a place there it's a merry-go-round it's called the carousel of happiness oh yeah it, yeah it was it was uh created by a Vietnam vet uh, who, you know, got sick of mm-hmm. war and decided to um, start carving animal uh, figurines. Oh, really? And so he carved all the animals and painted them and over a 30-year process, a long-term uh, okay, process. There you go. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and he ended up finding an old carousel that had been decommissioned somewhere in Utah and was able to uh, rehabilitate it uh, mm-hmm add all of his animals to it and then just over the years add little like details right so if you look up anywhere you'll see like some little thing a little bird over there or a mirror over there or something somebody's donated they charge one dollar per ride Mm -hmm. and the town donated the land it's right it's right near downtown you can go up there with the kids and for one dollar each everyone could go on the merry-go-round they have an old wurlitzer organ that plays oh, yeah. plays old oh, tunes <laughs> with the crank thing and you can see the gears you know turning and everything uh, but um incomparable sound yeah so whenever folks come we go up there and then uh you're in the mountains so it's fairly easy to get to a trailhead and so we did that um you know in some way the idea of being a good person or just create creating a good space that to me 
actually is a happy place. I, of all the places in the world, if I think of a location, a physical location yeah. uh, that um, is actually happy, actually ho- joyful, that's it. And that's it. yeah, so uh, we got to do that over the weekend. Uh, and so I, I was there, not just the beginning or the end. I, I, we had some some quality no, time. No, 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 <laughs> with yeah, but you have to, you have to, it, the beginning and the end is where you frame the visit. That's right. Yeah. That's uh, where you do it. That's why so, they're absolutely essential. What happens in the middle is always good stuff. If you can get the, if you can frame it. Okay. Well, right. thanks a lot. And yeah, I'm pleasure. glad that I had somebody to talk to uh, yeah. because it, it would have been <laughs> kind of awkward. <laughs> without okay. i would have All probably right. muddled my way through as i as uh, i did anyway but uh you nice still to... have the opportunity before it's all over anyway yeah but... well uh, you know i'm just gonna keep doing it and i no. and we'll keep getting better and i'll work on the technology like you know what i was describing earlier the process of getting this you know mm-hmm. published in the different channels a lot of that could be automated uh yeah. just through putting the pieces together and so that's kind of the thing I think about as well. But that takes time to do the research and to the, you know, various, right. Um, right. you know. So anyhow, thanks right. a lot, Ed. If you, could, if you could give me a link to the Lava DB, DB guy. Yeah, let me, uh, why don't I just paste it into the chat right now? Because I, I have it available. least like to take a look Let's see did you get that there's yeah there's a chat window now what oh that's totally not it okay <laughs> oops sorry i post i copied and pasted a link but i actually pasted a message yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was to somebody else. Yeah. It was it was too many words for a link, so I wasn't reading. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here, this is the proper link. Unbound com books where it looks feel. Unbound, that's right. All right. Good.